Well, the first thing that the Chinese did when they came, you know, the Chinese communists, they believe that religion is poison to the mind. Um, knowing that we are refugees in this country, knowing that our country is occupied by the communist Chinese, and knowing that our country is going through a very difficult situation, all the young people who are working here, they feel a great sort of, you know, what shall I say, uh, they are very dedicated to the Tibetan cause. And to, you know, and to, they are very fervent in their way of thinking, of saying that I'm a Tibetan and I have a responsibility. In October 1950, Communist China invaded Tibet. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, was just 15 years of age. Tens of thousands of Tibetans fled, making the painstaking journey to India, where the Dalai Lama established a Tibetan government in exile. Here, the values, cultures and way of life so cherished by the Tibetans would be kept alive. Many people lost their lives and a great number of children were orphaned, resulting in the need for a community to be established to care for them. The Dalai Lama and his sister, Sering Dolma, approached the Indian government and were granted with land to establish the first Tibetan children's village. Today, it consists of 38 homes, housing children from birth to 18 years of age and is one of the 15 children's villages scattered across India. My name is Ngawang Palmo. Uh, she lost her mother when she was 15 days old. That's because her father was drunk and did not look after the mother and child. And mother uh, was burned by her by putting kerosene and she was died. Since then she was looked by grandmother and we were informed that she, we could take her in a crutch. So we told the grandmother if she could give for at least two years. And they, she kept for the last two years, and now it's two weeks ago, she was admitted here. Now she will be permanent here, and I hope she will become a good Tibetan afterwards. I was informed by His Holiness to take over and to continue with this work. And so since in 1964, in May, I sort of took over and you know started to do what my you know uh, started to do what my sister started in 1960 and then my sister went for medical treatment to calcutta and later in calcutta they discovered she had cancer so she went to england but it was too late you know and then in november 1964 she passed away The first 51 children came and then His Holiness entrusted my sister to look after these children and that's how it was started in 1960 in May, soon after His Holiness moved to Dharamsala. At that Tibetan Children's Village. <laughs> when we first started in the early 60s, there was malnutrition. Children would be coming here, you know, with uh, a sores everywhere and then you know they would have skin diseases then there were times when children like you know even in the early uh, 60s you know when I was working here there would be they w we would receive like 200 children from Nepal and half of them had gastroenteritis and there were times when we you know 
in a night we would lose like three children or four children. It was really awful. We didn't even have proper mugs for the children. We, we would be getting a lot of assistance like, you know, like uh, tinned food. And then once the food, you know, you open the tin and the food was sort of given to the children. The introduction of houses, each with its individuals difficult and has rebuilt a caring, stable family atmosphere previously lost for so many here. Each child is assigned to some house chore, you know, they have to do. And they help the mother to cook, they help the mother to do the washing, they help the mother to clean up the house, to polish the floors, and everybody's kept busy. children to explore their surroundings, whilst their daily routine creates a structure, enabling them to easily adapt to their environment. My name is Tenzi Chambel and I am 15 years old. Daily we have to wake up at, actually the uh, food maker on uh, kitchen duty have to wake up at the 4.30. Uh, so they have to make the breakfast, tea and cut the breakfast, we are ready for the lunch.
If they go to the schools, existing schools in Tibet, they become more Chinese than Tibetans because everything is taught in, uh, in Chinese language. And from the primary school level, the Tibetan is not even taught to the Tibetan children. So that way, the parents are very anxious, and that's one of the main reasons why they're sending their children here for education. Whatever they're doing in China, they are doing in Tibet, and they are trying to make Tibetan children as Chinese as possible. And our Tibetan children are really sort of discriminated even in our own country, because the Chinese children get the first priority to get admission in the school. And for the Tibetans, if they're collaborating with the Chinese, of course, they get admission. If not, they have to pay an entrance fee, and which is quite high, all right? Once they've paid an entrance fee, monthly fee they have to pay. And many Tibetan parents cannot afford this. And then, once the child is admitted in the school, then, of course, up to, uh, up to the primary school level, they do teach a little bit of Tibetan. But once they reach, you know, the middle school level, they ask the children, do you want to learn Tibetan or do you want to learn uh, English? And most of the children opt for English because they say with Tibetan there's no future. So Tibetan is sort of, you know, in a very clever way, subtle way, they do away with teaching of Tibetan. There are schools in Tibet, but they are all Chinese oriented, and you know whatever you, they teach, you know it's it's not uh, what you want to learn, you know that's, and uh, and even if they teach Tibetan, you know it's distorted, you know version of the, the Buddhist uh, Buddhism and you know uh, Tibetan as a language, and and many children get you know diverse, you know and uh, get lost, you know in in between the two cultures, and I think uh, the parents, you know they they toil hard and you know hard to the, the part away with their children and send them here you know, to be educated in, in TCV. I think that's, um, that's a big uh, uh, grief for them, you know, first to lose them, you know, but they shouldn't have any regrets, you know, because they are in good hands, I think. And the parents should be happy about this, you know, the existence of TCV. And I think they are grateful to a great extent. In the infant section, we've got our trained Montessori teachers. And we followed this Montessori method of teaching since the early 60s. And we feel that this has worked very well for our children because Montessori uh, teaching emphasizes you know, a lot of attention to each individual child. That each individual child goes at his own pace, all right? And there are many different equipments and you know, learning kind of material that they use. And uh, the teacher teaches like one to one or one to two, two children and one teacher. Or sometimes if it's singing and working, you know, you have in groups. But it's a very uh, kind of, a uh, lot of individual attention is given. And that has worked wonders with us. And we have followed the Montessori method of teaching. And we have adapted it even in teaching Tibetan language. We feel that we are preserving the Tibetan culture, first of all, in the, you know, by introducing medium of instruction through Tibetan language. Because the pillar for any culture is the language, the spoken and the written language. And that way, because, you know, uh, with the advice of His Holiness, you know, to have, give education in Tibetan, now up to the primary school level, we do through Tibetan language.
Each house is responsible for cooking its own meals. The older children help each years ago. Our school uh, mostly is uh, sheep and cow's meat. Sometimes there's uh, potatoes. Uh, the vegetable is Spanish. Spanish, yeah. After class, in the morning and in the evening, they have prayers and prayers are explained to them and uh, this, is, uh, this is also very helpful for the children to know uh, to get into Buddhism. Tibetans have cherished this religion so much and we have practiced Buddhism so much that, you know, I jokingly say it's even in our veins, you know, in our genes. And Buddhism has become a way of life for the Tibetans. It's in everything that we do, it's related with, with Buddhism, with our religion. So for us Tibetans, religion is very, very important. It's always a kind of learning the religion but understanding trying to understanding the deeper meaning of it and the deeper meaning of all religion i would say is to become a good human being this is something which we try to emphasize <laughs> I think we have the support of the world, you know, and uh, they support us because of our approach to, um, our, you know, gaining independence. And uh, we should uh, keep to that, I think, you know, have a, have a very gentle way of approaching. And one day, the, the, you never know, you know, the Chinese may realize you know, that it's time now, yeah, to go back. Well, uh, His Holiness's uh, initiative to, to have dialogue with the Chinese and to have, you know, to solve the Tibetan issue through peaceful means. And His Holiness's hand is always stretched out to the Chinese. And we feel that, you know, with maybe the Chinese will, the Chinese leaders slowly will have the wisdom to come forward because there's enough war and, you know, unpleasant things happening in the world. And we Tibetans, you know, we are earnest about solving our problem through peaceful means and i think if the chinese would have the wisdom to say all right let's sit together let's discuss and his holiness has gone as far as saying you know tibet was an independent country that was the past now for the future let's work together and then if something doesn't happen soon we will be a lost cause you know really and china will just swallow tibet and there'll be no tibetans left if something doesn't happen quickly, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm.